Hi, I'm Dr. Taylor Van Weinboom, and I'm here to talk to you today about fibromyalgia and chronic pain syndrome. And we're going to go in those in two different aspects, both metabolic and neurologic, looking at them in a functional medicine and a functional neurology setting. So, there's one thing about all chronic health conditions is they have common threads. So as you see, you know, we talk about fibromyalgia, but you know, say we're talking about Crohn's, diabetes, vertigo. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, they all have common issues, common things that are going on. And that's what we're talking about as far as both metabolic and neurological imbalances. So if you have a chronic issue, it's not one or the other, it's a mixture of both. So metabolic issues could be things like anemia, thyroid dysfunction, adrenal gland dysfunction, uh, hormonal imbalances, and then neurological imbalances, we're not talking like hard lesions where you go in and get an MRI and you'd see an actual you know, lesion on the MRI. We're talking about soft lesions where there will be no imaging on the MRI or CAT scan or whatever you're looking at, but it still causes neurological issues. So, metabolism, metabolic side. So the food you eat goes in and produces energy. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about metabolism. So question is, 30% of your energy goes to what system? You know, we have endocrine, digestive, nervous, immune, and cardiovascular. So I'll give you just a second to think about that. So the answer is the nervous system. So the brain, spinal cord, all those nerves are what we're talking about when we talk about the nervous system. So if you had a metabolic problem, your brain will not work right because your brain is the most metabolically active organ in your body. So think about that for a second. So all cases, like I say, are a combination of both neurologic treatment and metabolic treatment. So your nervous system consists of your brain, spinal cords, your nerves. So your brain's your central computer. That's where everything kind of comes and computes, goes in, comes back out of. And what happens is your nerves, your communication cable. So if I touch my arm, my nerve takes that straight up to my central computer, which is my brain. And each cell is dependent on those nerve signals to stay alive and healthy. So say you have peripheral neuropathy. What happens is you get decreased nerve signals to your brain because you have numbness, you're not feeling things. What happens is, and they've done studies on this, is when you have decreased signals to the brain, your brain actually starts to die off. It starts to actually eat away at itself. So in that study, the same thing that they found was if you have peripheral neuropathy, your increased likelihood of Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, those kind of neurodegenerative brain diseases, it goes up quite a bit and that's why. So your body-brain connection. So your brain is your sensory organ, so that's where you perceive all things. Um, and then your body is one big receptor, like say touching my arm, touching whatever, gets received by nerves, goes up to the brain. Um, so your brain stays alive from constant input from your body's receptors. And that's what we're talking about with the peripheral neuropathy. If you don't have those receptors working like they're supposed to with numbness, that's when it starts to die off. So we have receptors everywhere. I'm talking about muscles, joints, skin, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and those are all different kinds of receptors for your nervous system. So I'm gonna ask you which two receptors light up the brain the most, give you the most input into the brain. And the answer is touch and gravity. So there's three parts to the brain. You have your cerebellum, which is the back part of the brain right through here. So that's that little part right underneath there. You also have your cerebrum, which is the big part of the brain, which people know as the brain. When you think about the brain, you think about the cerebrum up here, and then the brain stem. And that's where everything kind of comes in and integrates and comes back out. So how the brain works. So sensory input from your body goes to the same side cerebellum. So if I touch my left arm again, what happens is it comes up through here, hits my left cerebellum. Once it hits my left cerebellum, what it does is it crosses over into my right cerebrum. And what happens is, it does it on the other side of the body too. Now you get higher up in the nervous system, like say your eyes and things like that, they won't cross over because they don't go straight to the cerebellum first. So if you have upper brain has a major connection to the brain stem. Now the brain stem itself is mostly a breaking and an inhibitor. So talking about fight or flight, which would be our sympathetic nervous system. So what it's trying to do is break that system. If it's not breaking that system, that's where you get a lot of chronic issues and chronic health issues like fibromyalgia or chronic pain syndrome. So like say cerebellum into right cerebrum from the brainstem. So an overfighting of the sympathetic nervous system uh, causes lots of different issues. So here's some things that can cause chronic pain, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome, urinary tract infections, 
fibromyalgia like we're talking about, uh, migraine and tension headaches, poor posture, adrenal gland stimulation. Um, so there's a lot of things here and we'll cover them and I'm just going to kind of give you the list because there's lots and lots of things that go in here. So, so an overfiring sympathetic nervous system can cause blurred vision, increased swelling, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, dizziness, vertigo, heart palpitations, cold hands and feet, sensitivity to light and sound. So let's talk about the cerebellum specifically. So like I say, cerebellum's down through here. And what happens when you get cerebellar fatigue, you can have loss of balance because what happens is your proprioception, where you're at in space, is cerebellum. So if you went you know, in your room at night, you wake up, say so you have to go to the bathroom, and you can't see anything, none of the lights are on and you have really bad balance, you don't know where you're at, you know, you have a hard time standing up unless you have some kind of a light on, that's a cerebellar issue. Um, it can also be chronic and neck back pain. The reason for that is your spinal postural muscles that keep you in proper position are correlated to the cerebellum. So if you're, you know, have some of this going on or backward pitch, those would be cerebellar issues as well. We talk about clumsiness, dropping things, um, disorganized thinking, and a lack of output to the upper brain stem. So, I say there's a cerebellum to the cerebrum from the brainstem. So, frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes, those are just different lobes in the cerebrum itself. So, fatigue there would result in lack of inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, or the fight or flight like we're talking about. So, upper brain fatigue can cause lots of different things. Depression, anxiety, difficulty scanning pages while reading, difficulty adding or subtracting, difficulty with verbal expressing, so that would be like Broca's area, it's called your speech area. So if you're talking and you can't quite get the words out or you're talking like kind of stop in the middle of it, you know the word but you can't really spit it out. That'd be um, what we're talking about as far as cerebrum up through there. Uh, difficulty understanding language, uh, decreased memory, learning difficulties and lack of focus. Um, altered sensation like we talked about would be like peripheral neuropathy type thing. Uh, changes in handwriting, anger, body weakness, lack of motivation, and learning disability, like ADD and ADHD, which can be helped by brain-based therapy for that exact reason. So, we'll get a little bit more complicated here, but I'll try to break it down so it makes sense. So, the mesencephalon is part of the brain. What happens is that if it's overfiring, overfiring mesencephalon to the spinal cord, um, we'll get signals to the adrenal medulla, so the adrenal glands on top of your kidneys. What happens is it releases catecholamines and no epinephrine, which are released into the bloodstream. Once you do that, they actually activate type C nociceptor pain fibers, which causes chronic pain and fibromyalgia. So a lot of people have heard, yeah, fibromyalgia is, you know, a long time ago they say more musculoskeletal derived. They'll say, oh, you know, you have pain in your muscles, it's more, more muscular. But the finding, and which you probably know if you're watching this video, you have fibromyalgia, you've done some research on it, is it's nervous system related. And this is how it all works together. So, obviously with the chronic pain from myalgia, you have fatigue and sleep loss. So, overfiring with cephalon. So this will get really interesting for you, especially if you have fibromyalgia, is overfiring mesencephalon. So your mesencephalic reticular activating system fires the most at 3 a.m. and the lowest firing is at 3 p.m. So most people who have fibromyalgia have insomnia because their brain is firing, firing, firing so much at 3 a.m. where they also get chronic fatigue during the day because it's decreased activity around 3 p.m. You know, it's not exact 3 a.m. or 3 p.m., but those general vicinities of time. So that's what gives you the fatigue that comes along with fibromyalgia. So here's another way you can look at it. So we have emotional stress, which goes to the hypothalamus, which releases corticotrophin release factor which goes to pituitary, which releases ACTH, which is just a hormone that goes down to the adrenal gland as well, which releases cortisol, which is toxic to the brain. That's bad, right? Which can give you memory loss, which gives you problems focusing, which gives you the classic fibro fog that people have or talk about when they have fibromyalgia. You know, just that brain fog, you just kind of, kind of glazed over, you don't really, you know, interpret things like you should, and that's kind of what we're touching on with these soft lesions. So, now we're talking about the migraines. So, an overfiring mesencephalon, blood vessels in the brain dilate. What happens is there's this mesh around these blood vessels, 
Um, when they get dilated, they open up, they become bigger, and this mesh around the brain, the blood vessels gets irritated. When they become irritated, you have migraines, chronic migraines. So that's why if you have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, these things all make sense. That's why they all correlate, and that's why we can help you. So how does this happen? There's lots of different ways it can happen, but you can really sum them into three different areas. Chemical stress, physical stress, and emotional stress um, can cause brain fatigue and fewer nerve impulses. So chemical and physical stress to the brain. So, you know, that could be an anemia, so too little oxygen, blood sugar imbalance, so if you're maybe diabetic as well, or we really get crazy is if all this adrenal issue is happening from the increased firing of the mesencephalon, it actually makes you more resistant to insulin. So you'll have diabetic issues that come from a high firing mesencephalon. Uh, food sensitivities, which could be things like gluten, dairy, whey, um, soy, all those kind of things can also affect you through there. Uh, the immune system imbalance, so if you're autoimmune, um, so just a little bit about that is you have three basic parts to the immune system, the Th1, Th2, and Th3. Th1 and the Th2 should be in balance, so that's when Th1 kind of is your first line defense recognizes things, gets rid of them. TH2 finds them and puts an antigen on them so you can actually tag them so you can get rid of that for later. And the TH3 regulates them. So if they're out of balance, you're gonna get some autoimmune issues. So autoimmune issues could be something like diabetes, thyroid people, you know, if you have hypothyroidism, 90% of hypothyroids um, are autoimmune, which is obviously not good. So things like that would work into there. Poor diet. Um, which causes lots of inflammation. I mean, the standard American diet, which is SAD, S-A-D, is SAD for a reason because it's really, really bad. And it's really bad for you. Um, and then we talked a little about hypothyroid function. Um, prescription and non-prescription drugs can cause it as well. Uh, chronic inflammation, or let's talk about hidden, inf hidden infections, um, which can cause chronic inflammation and issues there too. So these are metabolic problems that create nervous system imbalances in the brain. Remember, the two are, are very intimately correlated. If you're having a metabolic issue, it's going to cause a nervous system issue. So emotional stress to the brain. So you know we talked a lot about the adrenal gland so far. So the adrenal gland disorders, so cortisol imbalances, which causes anti-insulin effects. And that's what we're talking about as far as the insulin uh, being resistant because of the adrenal gland, which raises your blood sugars, which will give you high triglycerides, LDL, and cholesterol on your blood tests. Um, so high insulin and glucose levels cause a breakdown of brain and nervous system. So chronic conditions don't get better on themselves. So that's a myth that you know people like to believe because hey, I don't need any treatment. You know whether it's low back, whether it's you know, fibromyalgia or IBS. If you have a chronic issue, they don't get better on themselves. A lot of people like to sit on them and wait and see if it'll go away by itself. So the longer you have a chronic condition, the faster the brain dies. So the Journal of Neuroscience reports that the longer the individual has had fibromyalgia, the greater the gray matter loss. So with each year of fibromyalgia being equivalent to 9.5 times the loss in normal aging. So you're losing 9.5 times greater gray matter in your brain every year you go with fibromyalgia. So in addition, it's estimated that 30 to 60% of patients diagnosed with fibromyalgia become disabled to the degree they cannot remain gainfully employed and that is with the myriad of medications prescribed. So it's just kind of a roller coaster, it's kind of snowballs on top of itself, it's, it's not a good thing. So the earlier you can get your issue taken care of, especially if it's fibromyalgia, the better off you're going to be, the more you can actually save. So if you have fibromyalgia for years, this has already happened, you know, we can't get that back, but we can stop it from getting any worse and we can gain a little bit of ground. So, how's brain-based therapy different? That's a good question. So, neuroplasticity, this is really the big key here. So, they used to think, you know, a brain older than three years is a really rigid structure. It couldn't mold, it couldn't change, it couldn't get better. It was just the way it was. Well, they found that's not true. So, scientists long thought that it wasn't malleable, but they found that it is a plastic organ. So, if we put certain inputs in, we can rewire the brain. So brain continually reorganizes itself and that's what neuroplasticity refers to. So it means that you can create brain from the input you get. 
So key points on neuroplasticity, your brain changes when stimulated. So that's what brain-based therapy is basically keyed in on. Uh, and different types of stimulation help different areas of your brain. So the cerebellum and the brain require two things to function at properly. It's fuel and activation. So fuel would be glucose, the food you put in, proper oxygen. And then activation would be brain exercises. And activation as far as just different things activating the brain. So therapies used for brain brain act activation um, may include, but not exclusively, things as easy as vibration on one side of the body. And the reason you do it on one side of the body, so if let's say we do some neurological exams, we find out your right cerebrum isn't working like it's supposed to. Say it's, you know, your temporal lobe. Well, we know if we put input into the left side of the body, it's gonna cross the cerebellum into that right cerebrum. So we can be very specific on which part of the brain is having an issue and what input we need to put in to activate it back to where it needs to be. Um, neurological adjustments, which would be um, the same, what's called unilateral adjustments. So we stay on one side of the spine, so we get all the activation on the side that's not having proper firing. Um, warm calorics work the same way. Uh, balance therapy, advanced muscle retraining, auricular therapy, and an olfactory stimulation. So that'd be like smell and things like that. Um, so visual and auditory stimulation, we have color lenses that we can use. So visual stimulation is huge in brain-based therapy because, I mean, just goes straight to the brain and just, it's just really, really good activation for the brain. Um, so faces and faces that you don't recognize all activate different things. Uh, eye exercises, mazes, large words within small words. So this is a big A with lots of little A's. Um, sounds and frequencies and metronome, things like that. So metabolic disorders causing brain imbalances. So we talked about them just a little bit as far as things like anemia, blood sugar imbalances, food sensitivities, uh, immune system imbalances, adrenal gland disorders, thyroid dysfunction, inflammation, and hidden infections. So how do you know if you have these? Proper testing. That's the only way you can ever find out is proper testing. The problem is, according to certain models, HMO, PPO model, they only allow for specific tests to be done um, they don't look at the broad picture of how other things correlate. So, have you basically been getting all your lab tests back and your doctor says, well, they're all within normal range. So, let's not look into it any further. Uh, you see a lot with thyroid patients is all their labs come back as normal, but they feel like crap. So, there's something going on that's getting missed. Same thing with fibromyalgia. So, lab ranges are in inaccurate. They use bell curves. Bell curves are a big curve like this. So. We'll talk about just a little bit more here in a second. So what we use are called functional lab values and they're more sensitive to reveal the actual problems that are going on. So this is why your lab tests are normal but you still feel sick. So here's the functional lab range. So this would be your bell curve right here. They say anything beyond here is abnormal, it's high. Anything beyond here is abnormal and it's low. What we look at it is here, the functional range, and that's where your body actually functions the best, it functions the highest degree. So these little green areas here on each side, these would be pre-disease states. So you've heard of pre-diabetes, you know, pre, you know, all those kind of things. Well, if we're waiting until you get one more number into abnormal before it's actually abnormal and we want to actually address it, what's the point of that? Why don't we take it before we get into that abnormal area? Why don't we keep you within this highest functional range so you're always feeling good, always feeling healthy? And that's how we look at the blood values differently. So. Here's just a couple examples. So glucose, functional range is 85 to 100. The traditional range is 65 to 110. So if you're looking at it in a functional standpoint, say you had a 73, well we'd say you're basically hypoglycemic. We need to start addressing that now before it becomes an actual issue. Or TSH, which is a typical thyroid marker. 1.8 to 3.0 is a functional range. 0.3 to 5.7, which is a really broad range, is the traditional lab range. So say you came in with 4.2. Well, they tell you you're doing just fine, but we'd say, you know, you're looking really hypo, hypothyroid, so we need to start addressing that now before you have some really bigger issues. And the same thing goes through all these. Um, just some examples as far as what that looks like. So metabolic treatments. So this is one of the major reasons we're getting chronic patients better is because we're simply running the necessary tests to diagnose the patient. So it's vastly different than, like say, your PPO or your HMO model. Um, so ask yourself, how long have I been going to my PPO or HMO doctor and I'm still suffering? I, I feel no different. I'm on the medications that they recommend. 
I'm doing all the things that they say, yet I still feel like garbage. I can't do the things I want to do. It's hard for me to get up and go to the bathroom. It feels like a 10 mile hike because I have so bad energy. I can't sleep at night. I'm tired throughout the day, but I'm still doing the exact same thing. So the problem is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. You got to try something different. It's not working. If it was working, you wouldn't be watching this video because you're still searching for an answer. And that's what we're trying to give you right now. So what we do is based on your history, we may run any of these tests. So we might run them all. We might run only a couple of them. So a complete blood panel. If you have other tests, we look at those you know, as long as they're fairly current. So we also do salivary hormone testing, which would be you know as far as the adrenal glands and things like that. Uh, we might do a stool ecology to see for hidden infections and things as well. Um, so we use Cyrex Labs and Pacific Biotesting to see food sensitivities, uh, maybe gluten or could be anything really. Uh, leaky gut syndrome and autoimmune testing to see if you're having some autoimmune reactions that are causing issues as well. So not included on here that we also do is genetic testing. So one thing you're going to want to look up on the internet, because I don't have it in here currently, is what's called the MTHFR gene. So the MTHFR gene has been highly correlated to people with fibromyalgia and a ton of different issues. So we also do genetic testing on all our patients to see if that's an issue that they're currently having. On top of that, we also do heavy metal testing. So like say fibromyalgia is a nervous system issue. If you have a nervous system issue and you have high toxic metals, what happens is all these metals are neurotoxins. So if that's part of your issue, we need to get those out of your system. So like say the MTHFR gene, we do the genetic testing for that, and we also do heavy metal testing to see if that's an issue, because they're all needed to find out exactly what's going on with you. It's not a cookie cutter system as far as somebody walks into fibromyalgia, okay, this is what we're gonna do, this is this, this, we're not gonna change it. It's very personalized, we have to do exactly what you need on that day, um, every single time we see you, to get you feeling better. It's not just, uh, I say, okay, fibromyalgia, what's the med for that? Okay, get out of here. No, it's okay, they have these issues based on the blood work, based on the other testing that we do. This is what needs to happen to get this person better. So, how many of you had all these tests done or any of these tests? If you haven't had these tests done, you need them. I mean, it's the only real way to tell if something is really going on with you. Um, and that's why, like say, PPO and HMO would do it because they're not gonna be covered by your normal, typical insurance model. So, you can say, neurological breakdown with metabolic complications. Everything's out of whack. What we gotta do is we have to get both the neurological and the metabolic sides working in conjuncture. So, as we continue to do that, we're correcting them uh, to bring the brain misfiring and the metabolic issues back into conjuncture, and we keep doing retesting to see exactly what needs to happen. So, periodic retesting, like I say, it's, let's know we're on the right track. We're getting you better. We're getting you to that end goal of feeling well, being able to sleep, having the energy, um, and then we finally get them all in correlation. What people pay us for is to figure them out. Basically, you come in, we figure out what exactly is wrong with you, how to correct it, and then give you an education so that you don't have to live here for the rest of your life. You don't have to live with your condition the rest of your life. We teach you how to take care of yourself so that you can leave here you know, however long your care plan might be, you know, maybe you're in here for, I don't know, three months, six months, whatever it is, and we figure you out, and we teach you exactly what needs to be done to keep you feeling well forever, and then get you out of here. Your life shouldn't be spent here or at any doctor's office. You should be getting well and getting out. So, what's next? So, we did basically two visits to people that come in, so we can really evaluate them and let them know whether we accept their case or not, whether we really think that we can help them. So typically on visit one, um, we do a complete neurological evaluation so we can see how the brain's misfiring and all those things aren't cor correlating through there. Uh, we review any existing labs, like say bring those in, you know, less lab work we have to do, that's fine, it doesn't bother me. Uh, we have you fill out specific forms that'll give us greater insight into what's going on with you, both metabolically and neurologically. And we always say, you know, if possible, bring your spouse because we want them to be on board. We want them to know what's going on. We want them to know how to help you as well because a lot of times, you know, a lot of people, not me, of course, you know, me and my wife came saying, hey, aren't you supposed to be doing this? You kind of get a little bit lazy with things. You know, when things are doing good, people tend not to worry about them, that, which shouldn't, shouldn't be the case. You should always kind of keep on top of it. So we want your spouse here so they can know what's going on, what we're finding, 
and what would be entailed in care and get you better. Now they don't have to come to every appointment, just the first two so we can kind of get on the same page. Um, but they're more than welcome to come to every one if they really want to. Um, so visit two is a case review, whether we accept the case or not, whether we really think that we can help you or not. Um, an overview of further testing that would need to be completed. Uh, review the neurological things that we, all, we found from visit one. Overview of the treatment plan that we would come up with for you specifically. Uh, review any financial obligations and like I say, you must be with your spouse just so we're all on the same page. What's going on and why. So commitment slash insurance. So there's three rules for acceptance of case here at our office. Is one, you must be serious about making serious life changes. Um, it took a while to get yourself to where you're at. You have to be committed to your health to actually get it back to where it needs to be. And number two, you have to take accountability for your health. Like say, if you're doing lots of things that are causing yourself to feel sick and be sick, you have to take accountability for those and you know stop whatever that may be. And obviously it's very specific to the person, but we have to have that commitment. And then insurance plus Medicare only pays a small portion of this care. So what we've done is we made our care plans affordable so that 96% of people that come to our office can afford it. Um, so everybody wants to know a ballpark. So if I have the ballpark, how much it usually costs, it can be as little as two to $400 a month for 18 to 24 months. Now care doesn't last that long. I'm just giving you a ballpark figure as far as the money goes. Um, then also you have to ask yourself these questions. On a scale of one to 10, how serious is your illness? How does it affect your relationships, your work, your ability to enjoy life? On a scale of one to 10, how serious are you about getting healthy? about eliminating your illness. And then due to time constraints, we can only accept those that are really, truly committed to feeling better. So just wanna thank you for watching the video here on our fibromyalgia. My name is Dr. Taylor Van Weinboom. We're located here in Ames, Iowa. I have my email address right here if you wanna contact us with any information or any questions about this. We also have our office number on there. Or if you want, there'll be a link below that you can click on if you wanna contact us as well. Thank you.